Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first episode in our LinkedIn Live monthly series, Changing the Great Resignation to the Great Alignment, where we tackle real solutions and challenges that are affecting the workplace today as a result of the times we're in. And we're going to approach it from multiple vantage points to help shift the mindset be a little bit provocative, have a little bit of fun. We're really looking forward to having a distinct dialogue today with real strategies and solutions. Today, tackling the office to go back to the office setting or not to go back to the office setting. And we're gonna encourage questions in the chat as we go. We're gonna address them periodically as we go. So my name is Andrea Pagnosi. I am a career empowerment coach. And I am going to be looking at these situations through the perspective of the individual who's looking to get ahead in their career and find fulfillment, really realize their true career potential. Rhonda? Hey, everyone. Welcome to our first LinkedIn Live. I'm Rhonda Robinson. I am a certified professional in talent development, and I've been doing that for about 20 years, working with companies across the globe in multiple industries. And today, my perspective will be bringing in more the what employers should be thinking about in order to attract and retain talent in terms of how they're thinking about returning to the office or not, and what we should be considering from their point of view. Jay. Hi, everyone. I'm Jay Marks. What I focus on in, in my practice is a culture, inclusion and psychological safety, and senior teams. So obviously with the whole return to the office or not issue, there is a big aspect of what's your culture like and that that really is a big consideration in how people who are changing jobs or staying think about whether they're going to change jobs or stay these days. In the last couple of weeks, certainly for me, I've probably spoken to about 10, I'll say potential clients, people I, I didn't know previously who I had a chance to meet. And what came up for eight out of 10 of those conversations was leaders and business owners facing the issue of people who want to come back. I have people who don't want to come back. Some people had some really expensive real estate. They wanted people to come back to, but all of those conversations really got around to how do we approach that? You know, what, what can we do that's really going to serve the organization and serve the individuals well? So that's how we ended up on this being the, the first topic we, we came up with for our series of the great alignment, because ultimately I think we're, wherever we Wherever you end up, I shouldn't say we, but you, if you're making this decision, alignment between what you say and what you do and leaders and your teams is really, I think, the key to making it work. And so by saying that, that doesn't mean hybrid is better than remote, is better than on-site. What it means is, is you need to do the things that we're going to talk about today to really help be in alignment so people feel like whatever you decide is working for the leaders, for the teams, for the individuals. So I'm going to turn it back over to Andrea because she shared a story with us about a week ago that really touches on all three components of this, but really, in a sense, it's a sad story, <laughs> but it, you know, it's a great illustration of, of what's happening these days. Yeah, thanks, Jay. I, it is a bit of a sad story, a bit frustrating. It has a happy ending. I mean, it involves a, a client that hired me, Q3 anyway, of last year, and he felt extremely stuck where he was. He had been in the job he'd been in for about a decade or more, and he was a high performer, very consistent, well-liked, but he wasn't on anybody's radar for promotion. And he was like, it's now or never. I see a lot of people advancing as a result of the great resignation. So I'm gonna put my, my oar in the water and I'm gonna see what else is out there for me. And he had two very specific things when he started working with this one recruiter who had this amazing job. I mean, when you read the job description, you said this was made for him. 
you've got to, you'll never forgive yourself if you don't, right? And he did. And he said to the recruiter very early on and several times throughout this sort of winding road of an interview series, he said, I don't want to tell anybody I'm working with that I'm looking until the very end. I, I don't want them to know, God forbid it goes south and I don't get anything. And the second and most important thing he said was, this is a remote opportunity, is it not? It's in the job description and it's in the posting. I just want to make sure. And the recruiter said, yes, why do you keep asking? And he said, I, because I won't apply for it if it's not location free. And it wasn't because of COVID. It was because COVID afforded him to be home with his wife who had multiple sclerosis. And he was very verbal about it. He said, you know, I, I'm only going to take an opportunity that is location free. That's a remote opportunity. He went through 13 interviews. And when I say 13 interviews, let me be clear that it wasn't 13 one-on-one -on -one interviews. Four of those interviews were panel interviews where they, he met with at least 25 people at this company. It's a fortune 150 company that will remain nameless to protect the innocent, but it was a very arduous interview series. And he kept asking, this is location free, location free, location free. Fast forward to January of this year, he got the job. He gave his references, references were called, clarified that this was remote yet again. The written offer came in and at 10 o'clock at night, he called me and he said, I would never do this to you. Otherwise you've got to, you've got to see what they offered me. And I'm thinking he's hit, you know, the lottery, got a nice raise, got the promotion, got the title, got the corner office, but that's the thing. He got the corner office. Suddenly the job offer said it was a in-office position because we're migrating back to the office by April 1st. He was dumbfounded, absolutely blown away. And I believe, and I've always said this as a manager, as a corporate leader, that for the right candidate, you make accommodations to make sure that they can come aboard. If they have to work remotely, they have to work remotely. And I said, go back to the recruiter and see what they can do. And the recruiter said, no can do, no compromise. So he had now revealed his interest to look for other opportunities to his company, which he didn't want to do. It's out there now. <laughs> he gets the job and he's gone 13 interviews, 13 rounds in the ring, as they say, and he can't accept the job. And he didn't. He didn't accept the job. He did get another job. But this was horrific, absolutely horrific experience. And... It, it goes to show that companies are making decisions based on the company's needs, not necessarily on the candidate's needs, no matter how much time they've put in, no matter how much they've invested, it's still on the company's terms. And unfortunately, the, the other two final candidates had already gotten other opportunities, so they had to repost the position. So that set them back in time and money. So that's, that's the example that I shared of how frustrating these times are right now. That's a compelling story, Andrea, and we're getting some great conversation going in the chat. Before we jump in there, I'd just like to share a couple of level setting concepts so that we can be thinking about this as we move forward in the conversation. Call this the changing the great resignation to the great alignment series and your story is a perfect example of how there was a lot of misalignment happening during just that one scenario. If we think back on the great resignation, why did it happen in the first place? Typically, it wasn't one event that drove someone to leave their employer. It was essentially death by a thousand cuts. It was little things over time. Something icky <laughs> that was happening that created such discomfort that they said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go look for something else. That icky means different things for different people. So beyond salary benefits and perks, a lot of times employees can articulate exactly what it was that was driving them away. But more importantly, 
our work environment is not conducive to having conversations about it. We need to be polite when we're exiting our company. We don't want to burn bridges, so we don't tell people what they're doing wrong. Maybe they already did. Employee surveys or candid conversations or even the exit interview, but it's hard to say what you're exactly thinking. So people will tell their previous employer they're leaving for a shorter commute or maybe a bump in salary. Then they go on to their next interview and it's this false positive environment. I'm a great candidate. We're a great place to work. Let's get together. And then they get into the mix and uh-oh, more icky. Because again, we're not having this kind of conversation about what's actually taking place or what you're looking for in a job and in an honest manner, what the company can offer. I was just talking to somebody yesterday, a talent acquisition specialist who was saying that they are going back to the office and how can they convince convince employees that they need to come back to the office. It's costing companies a, a lot, a lot of money because we're not aligned. So the whole idea is let's rethink this and be in the great realignment. Let's not try and force people to retrofit into what your company offers. Hey, there's people that want to work in the office. Let them go work in office environments. There's people that want to work remote. Let's let, let them go work for companies who offer that or a hybrid. I think that's the idea here is fostering that candid conversation to find out what people truly want and be honest and candid from an employer perspective as to what you truly offer and what your parameters are. So I see Cindy in the chat. She says, I find candidates do not like multiple interviews. Bingo, that's point number one. And you can lose good candidates in the long hiring process, and they need to be clear on the remote versus on site. For those who are in the chat, if you don't mind, put in the chat yes if you, either your company or your hearing of companies who are schizophrenic in their approach to whether it is office, time to go back to the office, remote's okay or hybrid's okay. Put yes if you're still hearing a lot of confusion and chaos about where companies stand. Yes, 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 oh yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of yeses. So let's go back to and start with just the whole, yep, there's another yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of yeses. Um, you know, when we think about marketing, like a campaign, when we think about business operations, there's always a strategy that's created. People know who's supposed to do what, by when, and the expected outcomes. It seems like when it comes to people and this whole conundrum of the great resignation, reshuffle, realignment, there isn't the same effort to put together the talent strategy and the approach to the business. Personally, from folks I've talked to, it seems like it's because talent acquisition is put in a precarious position to not have a voice or a strong enough voice in that discussion. Jay, Andrea, what are your thoughts there? You know, I think you touched on on something, Rhonda, that is you know, so key. And, and a lot, I think a lot of what people can do is, is go back to the basics. But you talked about clear expectations. And I think that clear expectations are the first step to having alignment. Because if if you don't have a good foundation, if you're not clear on this is what's important to us, this is what's important to me as a leader, as well as you said in the interview process, finding out what is important to the candidate, then you're just gonna have a problem <laughs> because if people aren't clear on what's important, it's a lot harder to move forward in, in a constructive way. And, and I think one of the, the things about, you know, as an example, folks who, who were hired during COVID who have, have never met anybody, you know, the, the, 
interview process took place remotely. Now they're working remotely. That they've never had a handshake or a hug with anybody, and you know that that creates stress in and of itself. If you add to that unclear expectations, and I, I think a lot of us know that you know managers and companies aren't always great at setting expectations. So a lot, I think, of what needs to, to happen today is if we just go back to the basics, you just have to amp up the basics. You have to amp up sharing information. You have to amp up good communication. You have to amp up giving people the opportunity to ask questions because you need that, that clarity, you know, all the, all the more. So many things are changing and there's so much ambiguity and uncertainty in general. I think, again, Andrea's story <laughs> illustrated that. We started off with, yeah, you know, you'll be able to work remotely. We end up with, oh, by the way, you have a great office. We expect you to be in it. Yeah. So something, you know, yeah. somebody missed that there was a disconnect along the way there. And so that's one of the things that I think is key, is starting with good expectations. And if things change, because we know things are gonna change, you know, there could be another variant, who knows what could be next. But the, the point is the basics of expectations, communication, asking questions, staying in touch with people are, are so important. And, you know, Cindy just, put something in the post, which I, I think mm -hmm. is, is also key to, to what's going on today, which is, you know, once somebody feels like they were not treated well or unclear expectations, lack of alignment, yeah, it shows up on TikTok or Facebook or wherever it's going to show up. And, you know, that that's one more consideration that makes it hard to get things right. So, I, I fully agree. You said something there, Jay, a few moments ago, you used the word amp up. One of the things that I think is a real challenge is, and, and I know this is going to hit Rhonda in the right way, because she makes some really good strategies and solutions for companies that are sustainable. It's the amp up part that companies aren't doing. They're putting one and done's on things. They're not walking the talk. When you get in the door, things aren't as advertised. It's greener pastures maybe, but it's another company with another set of issues that, you know, we're making concessions for because they're trying to check boxes on certain things. So when you're trying to find a job, it's easy to get sucked into the newness of it. But what I try to encourage people to do is in the interview process, it's as much about whether you're a fit for their culture as it is whether their culture is fit for you to work with them and to strive with it. So I encourage people to ask as many questions as you can about what's it like to work a day in the life here? Can I talk to somebody who has had, I mean, if you're, if you're somebody who has to show your references, why can't the company, right? I would encourage people to ask those questions about what types of things they offer because what shows up on TikTok and Cindy, excellent point, and what shows up on social media is the fact that they don't have an ability to walk the talk. They just are luring you in the door. And then once you get there, it's the same problems all over the place. What say you, Rhonda, about that? Yeah, absolutely. I was just talking to a client this week about their dynamics that they're, I'm going to use the word enduring right now. First, we have to recognize that the employer-employee relationship has not evolved since the industrial age. In the industrial age, there were only a couple of opportunities for people to work. If you didn't farm or have your own like seamstress business or something like that, you worked in the coal mines or other type of mining environment, or you worked in the local factory. People couldn't migrate to work like they do. They couldn't commute to work. They just had to get to wherever there was employment. And so the employers had all the cards and 
It was a parent-child relationship. You do as I say, when I say, and you don't ask questions. And people lived with that because they needed a paycheck. They needed to make money and survive. Well, we evolved from that a long time ago, but we've still tolerated that attitude in the workplace. And now after the pandemic, people realize, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm, no, we need and deserve adult adult relationships. So think of it like dating. You want someone who's going to be your partner. You have different responsibilities. You have different roles in the relationship, but people want to be treated like an adult. Companies are dictating terms of how people work. To some degree, it's necessary. We acknowledge that. But when there is flexibility, the employer mindset has not evolved. I'll give you another example. I was talking to yet a different group this week in the Northeast, and they're mandating that everyone come back to work into the office. And the reason was we have this beautiful real estate that no one's using. Okay, what does that say? You're placing the value of brick and mortar over how you value the employees. So you can have the best employee recognition program with chalked keys and thank you notes and add a boy, add a girls, add a you programs in place. But if it is, we don't value you as much as we value our building, people are going to leave because it's a contradiction of a contradiction of communication. Yeah, absolutely. The gentleman that I gave the example of, the reason the recruiter gave for them going back wasn't necessarily that they, you know, have infrastructure to fill, but it was the sense of community. They had done what are called glint surveys. Many people are familiar with them. They're satisfaction surveys that are given to employees on an annual basis. And since the pandemic, shocker, people's satisfaction scores were low in terms of the sense of community and camaraderie and connection. So we wanna raise those scores because they're very important to us. And I thought, Gee, I wonder if they dug into the responses of the surveys, if people were saying specifically it was the one-on-one -on -one connection or that there haven't been solutions or strategies implemented to engage in a virtual community. You know, and it really is becoming a constellation of issues. You no, know, it's because you mentioned too there, connect, the connectivity and the flexibility. Cindy had a comment in the chat a couple of minutes ago. The number one ask is flexibility, you know, per current polls. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I think then it becomes important to, to understand, well, what does flexibility mean? Because it, it can mean different things to a lot of people. Like hybrid sounds flexible, but if the thing is everybody's going to be hybrid, two or three days a week, well, that's not flexible. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's no different than saying we're going to be 100% this or 100% or that. And so what flexibility means, being involved in the decision, that, mm -hmm. that people really want involvement in, in whatever that decision is. And you know, again, the involvement goes back to equating to alignment. If I have the chance to participate, then at least if it doesn't go my way, I had the chance to participate. I saw a really interesting study over the weekend that everybody wants flexibility. And obviously people who were working remote feel that a lot more than people who are working hybrid. Because if I'm working hybrid, that means I can't do all the things that I used to do when I was remote every day. So I, I think that that's, that's one issue. I think that the connectivity issue is another one that was interesting in this and the results that I saw, which is people who are hybrid or are in the office feel more connection because, you know, they, they do have the chance for that face-to-face -face interaction where if you're remote, you know, you, you don't have that as much. So I think that the, the question is, is really how do we create connectivity regardless? Because the other thing that we all know is if we go back to 2019 and 2018 and all those years before, 
it's not like everybody felt connected. It's, it's not like everybody was really having a great time in the office, you know, work wasn't provided. everybody wasn't connected. And, and so for the folks who say we want everyone back in the office because everything's better face to face. Yeah, to a degree that's true. But now that people have had this taste of not being in the office and people who are, you know, less representative demographics, you know, all of those groups and virtually every survey I've seen prefer being remote because it's easier to be a less represented group remotely. And oftentimes less represented groups don't benefit as much from, you know, from what's going on in the office. And I'll, I'll just throw this in cause I, I just saw this one yesterday, hybrid equity is the new concern that mm -hmm. if we're going to be hybrid, then how do we make sure that folks out of the office get the same opportunities as, as folks in the office, which is, you know, I, I think I've just spilled a, a number of different things into the conversation. How do we create connectivity regardless? of if we're in or out, because unless you're working for a company that says everybody is back in the office a hundred percent, then you're going to have people who aren't always in the office and you're going to have to figure out how to, how to make that work. Dr. Pauline Crawford brings up a really good point. This idea of this parent child relationship is really very blocking for employers in their emotional integrity, if you will. And there's a lot of chatter right now about emotional intelligence, EQ, and empathy in the workplace. A lot of companies are trying to institute things that look visible to try and keep employee engagement, but really that's just superficial stuff. And the reason is because it's harder to think about how people's brain works and how people work emotionally. What we're really talking about is how behavioral neuroscience describes triggers of people's behavior in the workplace or in social settings and work is a social setting. And you'll hear different words used for these things, but the essence really centers on five things. Certainty. The more certainty you can provide, whether people agree with it or not, certainty is key because without certainty, people freeze. They don't know what to do. And so it's better to make a, they say it's better to make a bad decision to make no decision. Just decide, are you coming back to the office or not? And then people can decide if that works for them or not. The great alignment, they can go work someplace else or stay with you and tolerate it, but they can decide. The second is autonomy. Jay, you talked about this. People want to feel heard. They want to feel like they have a voice and that they were heard. Now, if there's a reason why it didn't go their way, as long as they were heard and it was a fair duration on their request, most people are okay with that. The third is relationships. Everyone has a different take on relationships. Introverts love working from home. The workplace has largely disregarded introverts because it's the extroverts usually who are saying, come in and let's go to the pizza party and let's do after hours stuff and let's have a Halloween costume thing. And the introverts are like, I need time to regroup because their energy is drained by being around people. They need quiet time to re-energize. It's not that they're not social people. They just need some downtime for themselves to recharge. And then, like you said, if if it's an environment where you don't feel included, why would I then equality or sense of fairness? You talked about the hybrid equity and why can some people work from home, but I can't. And then the last one is feeling valued and appreciated. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of attention is right now because it's a little easier to do things that are visible, tangible efforts towards that. So I'm loving these comments about how we really need to be paying attention to the emotional drivers of how people make decisions and whether they're disengaged or engaged. And that is something that we need to have radically candid conversations about in HR, in leadership, and with our employees. Totally agree. I feel as though, and I, I look back to Cindy's comment about underrepresented, you know, LGBTQ+, plus, other types of groups, religious, 
you know, suddenly everybody's more attuned to the fact that we're all different and that we're diverse because of diversity, equity, and inclusion. But the reality is we've always been diverse. We've always had equity issues. What we need to do is we need to take our frontline managers through education to treat people differently, recognize the differences, champion those differences and celebrate them in ways that position people as individuals who bring value to the organization and are recognized for that. And that to me is grossly misrepresented. I fully agree with Cindy's comment. I think that there are states that are implementing laws and regulations that companies are complying with that are trying to blur the lines a little bit. I think we need to champion the lines right now more than ever and exalt people for what they bring to the table regardless of their race, creed, color, or you know, gender identity. I think it really is about the best person for the job. And oh, by the way, we've got a lot of people who are happy being hybrid. Let's see how they do in that environment. Let's champion that environment. Let's measure people on different metrics. Let's hear what people have to say and really run an organization, God forbid, from a bottoms up perspective instead of a top down dictatorship. And I think that's what people had been doing for so long. It became familiar. And now we're going to have to, as Jay said, really kind of strike a balance of new types of equity, new types of of opportunity within an organization. And that means different types of recognition and, and different types of, of metrics overall. I thought this was a great comment and thanks Pauline, where it's just that, you know, talking about a safe environment with, you know, non-judgmental, a sense of inclusion and belonging, psychological safety. And the reason I wanted to show this was because People feel isolated in the office and maybe that's why many people don't want to come back to work. Mm -hmm. So again, it's, it, it just goes back to, to the issue of, I don't care if you're hybrid or remote or what you're doing. If you can't do this, regardless of yeah. what the situation is, why are people going to stay? You know, why are people going to want to feel, you know, I'm aligned with this environment and then you know that they will get into the the grass is greener kind of, of mindset now going back to something rhonda said at the very beginning this has been going on long enough now that we're starting to see boomerangs where people are leaving the job they went to and wanting to go back to where they came from because now they're going yeah i, I guess it's not as bad as it used to be these days people you know are very willing to challenge their bosses, the, the companies they work for. And it might be more, you know, younger folks who are willing to do that, but there's more younger folks who may, who are making up the workforce. To that point, Jay, the, the younger generations that we're bringing into the workplace now are digital natives. They've communicated on Snapchat. Snapchat has no words to it. It's a picture of somebody you're showing emotions right? They're used to having this virtual framework. It's funny because my daughters are 17 and 21. And the other day I told them they had to, to call somebody and I said, you mean talk to them or text them? And, you know, so this is a rational thing for this generation to be considerate of the fact that they would have to be in person with somebody. Think of the people that graduated in 2019, 2020, coming into a virtual workspace and are now being asked to come into a brick and mortar. And they're like, I've never worked in this environment ever. They don't know how to operate. So I think there's a lot of, of truth to the fact that different generations are handling this remote situation very differently as well. Now, managers didn't sign up to have to think about you know, how do I make somebody feel like they belong? How do I ensure that there's a sense of inclusion? How do I work with potentially three different cohorts of employees on site, hybrid and remote? I don't think they signed up to do all the stuff 
that managers need to do today. I'd like to throw a little bomb into this one because that's an important (laughs) statement there. Far too long, organizations have allowed managers to not pay attention to the people. You're a people manager. You don't manage buildings. You don't manage spreadsheets. You don't manage widgets. You manage people who do the work. And so that's another thing that we need to rethink is how do we support people managers in thinking people first? Because imagine this, how much more work do you get done if you invest in your people, they're fully engaged, they're collaborative, and they're putting in extra effort to get the work done. There's recent research that shows that 75% of current employees would leave their job, a different role, a different industry, a different career path for a more empathetic employer. Leaving hybrid or remote out of it, just a more empathetic employer. And another 75% would go to an empathetic employer in lieu of a higher salary. Now, some people are saying, you know, oh, we create this coddling work environment because people don't want to work. They're just looking for a place to skate by so they don't have to do much. No. Additional research shows that the majority of people work longer hours for empathetic employers and are less likely to burn out. It's a win-win-win. It is. We really need to be investing in leaders teaching them to be more empathetic, thinking people first, what do my people need? How can I best support them to work their best? And we all get more out of it. Yep, happy people are productive people. If you champion what their strengths are and you coach to the things they need coaching on, which is customized, it's personalized. It's not a one size fits all. I'm going to coach everybody the same way and create mini me's because I was successful, right? It's really getting into the nitty gritty of getting to know your people, championing your people, making sure you have pulled the levers necessary for their success. That's people centricity at its finest. And that's where people are going to stay at companies, excel at companies, promote from within at companies. And that's what we need to get back to. It's not getting back to a workplace. It's getting back to a workplace where you can feel engagement, value, trust, and empathy, to your point. So what we could start to do is narrow the funnel a little and for the, the three of us start to think about what would we recommend that folks can have as takeaways or ideas to make it work for everybody? What do you want to leave us with? First and foremost, employer mindset needs to change, not only with the adult adult relationship, but if you want employees to trust you and come work for you, you have to trust them and trust that different work environments work best for some people. Like if someone comes in for six hours, leaves for two hours because they need to go pick up their kids from school and then works from home and the work's getting done. Employers have to let go of this butts and seats, I need to see you working mentality if we're ever going to have this adult adult relationship. I don't monitor my husband that way. (laughs) <laughs> nor would I ever want to. So why do we do it to each other in the workplace? That's why Rhonda's fun to do this with. She'll say something like, I don't monitor my husband like that. <laughs> I don't either. I don't either. <laughs> if I got paid for it, I might. But yeah, no, I think it's a perfect segue into what I will leave people with, which is from the vantage point of the individual. And it's what I try to impart wisdom in people is ask questions about the organization you're trying to become a part of. And if you're part of an organization and you really love it or once did, ask the questions, be vocal. It's not going to change. It's the art of being stupid to clam up and put up and shut up. It's not going to change if you do that. So speak loud and proud about what you stand for, what you work within and And be very, very honest when those surveys come out, those satisfaction surveys, be honest because 
I know people feel very skeptical about, oh, it's not anonymous and it's, there's going to be repercussions and things like that. But the reality is if you're upset enough to be one foot out the door, there's still one foot in. There's hope that you can change things and there's power in people. So really do be honest because honesty is always the best policy. Well, and, and honesty, again, when we go back to our whole idea of alignment, I mean, how are you going to be aligned if there isn't that kind of candor and straightforwardness? And that starts at the top, clearly. We've touched on the whole idea of walking the talk and the importance of, of leadership. One phrase I've used for years is, are you and your team on the same page? Look, we have to agree on what's important and we have to get our story straight. If people aren't clear on what's different, it just creates that uncertainty, that ambiguity, and that thing that says, I don't know if I want to be here because I can't even get a straight answer. A couple of other quick tactical things, those have always been there and nobody likes silos. You know, silos get in the way of doing a lot of things. And if you have people who have never been on site and people who have never met anybody else, it's more that much more likely that they have very little idea about what other people in the organization are doing. I spent a lot of time with this on a client before the pandemic started, which was that they wanted their, the level down from the, the C-suite to work together more effectively. And they all said when we, when we started the engagement, well, if I really knew what other departments did, I'd probably be able to work with them better. And this was a 75 year old organization, <laughs> whatever you can to help people learn about what others do is key. And the last thing that I thought about is I recalled, uh, I worked for a place years ago where if you were a new hire, you got a buddy, you know, and your buddy was an experienced person. And I was thinking, well, if, what if we had, if I'm remote, I have an onsite buddy, or I have a hybrid buddy. I mean, presuming we're not all remote, you know, have a buddy who's been around for a while with the new person. And cause I remember that worked really well. So, you know, walk the talk, bust your silos and have buddy because everybody likes to have a buddy. So I'm going to put up a slide and Rhonda is going to talk a little bit about our next get together. We're going to continue the conversation about efforts that people are attempting in the workplace to influence their culture. And I like to mix it up a little bit. So we're calling it lipstick on a pig. <laughs> are some of these things really meaningful to build a culture of community? Or are they unintentionally or maybe intentionally building a culture of compliance? How much is being orchestrated and manipulated as opposed to building a great place to work? We hope that you'll join us and invite your friends.